just happy to be here. Yep. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Get Your Fill, Financial Independence and Long Life, where we explore ways to achieve those two goals. I'm your host, Chris McCarran, and I am so excited that John Bianchi is here today because he's not just the Airbnb guy. He's the Airbnb data guy. So he's going to help us to figure out not just like not how to do Airbnb because any fool can put a couple of pictures in a description on the thing, but why should we do it? How's it work? Okay. So John, thanks so much for being with us today. Yeah. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. So how did you, so I feel like now most people kind of know about Airbnb, like, but when I, when I first learned about it, it was from a friend actually in the UK. So I was kind of surprised that it actually started here. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, but yeah. It wasn't a thing, right? It was young people like backpackers. How did you first find out about? It? Yeah. Um, honestly, I don't even recall how I first came across it, but there was a situation where I was living with my, uh, I had an apartment with my brother and my brother moved out. So I had this extra room and I had heard about this Airbnb thing. And I was like, I'm just going to give it a shot. You know what I mean? And like, so, um, I remember just it being like a total test trial thing. I downloaded the app and uh, took pictures of my, of the, of the spare room. Like this is when, you know, I was okay with living with random people. <laughs> you know what I, mean? like, I, was, I was like in that kind of an experiment. And, yeah. uh, and so I uploaded it on, I put the room onto Airbnb and then I actually did it so wrong. Like I uploaded <laughs> it so improperly that I ended up uh, living with my parents for two weeks. When I first got started. <laughs> I, you gave I didn't want to get out. Yeah, I didn't want, yeah, I literally just gave out the entire house, gave my room. Like, I'm like, I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> but I didn't want to get a bad review, right? So I was like, right. well, I, I can just have it. <laughs> and so, but then like, you know, time kind of went on and I, I learned more about how to do it and like figured it out. And, uh, really like the cool thing for me was that my rent was only like $700 a month. And I was making like during the summer months, like somewhere between 12 and $1,500 a month, which isn't like crazy money, but when you're not paying your rent and you have like extra cash coming in, exactly. Good to go. You know what exactly. I mean? I was, I was super happy about it. Yeah. And, yeah. and the guests too, were you get some fun guests that would come through. So it was always yeah. a good time with them. But yeah, if, if you're going to do that, if you're going to share your living space, you definitely have to be of a certain mindset. Oh yeah. I would not do it again. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not trying to do it anymore. <laughs> but you might want to do it again when you're like retired. You know what I mean? Where you're like, oh, you know, let's have some random people through the house. Cause I'm kind of bored and you know, whatever. Yeah, maybe, maybe, who knows? There's, it's always interesting. I always got like, yeah, I was never really bothered or upset by anybody that ever came in. And like, sometimes I get like, four people that would come in and they would all be from like, I think there were some people from Spain and they were just all like drinking, have a good night and playing cards. And like, I was there hanging out with them. Like, so yeah, you never know. It's, it creates good stories. Cool. So how did yeah. you go from doing, you know, like renting your bedroom, your spare bedroom to getting into being the data guy? So I'll try and give a, a sort of quick version of this, but um, <laughs> I was a, I was an investor before this. And when you're an investor, you do a ton of, ton of research. Right. And so I was, if you're a good um, investor. You do a ton of research. If you're yeah, <laughs> I guess so. you're going to be a successful considered... investor. <laughs> yeah. Successful investor. But, um, and so I just, I knew I didn't like the investing world, like the entire, like day to day, the business, everything around it. And so I was looking for something different and I, you know, Start, I was testing out this Airbnb thing. And then I just started reading articles about like, what is, what else is possible with this? And then I realized that people had like full out businesses uh, running Airbnbs and had tons of properties. And they were just like, you know, if you're, if you're making some cash flow with one, like what if you had 50, right? You know what I mean? And, and so I learned more and more. And then I actually, uh, what really sparked it for me was I came across this site called AirDNA and AirDNA has all the data in the world about every single Airbnb that exists. They track how much they're making and all this different stuff. And I realized like how much money these people were making, right? It's almost like if you knew how much every McDonald's was making, you might want to run a McDonald's. You know what right. I mean? If there was just like open information about that, right? And so um, I think it was, it was kind of like that that really sparked it for me. And then I opened up a couple of homes in Michigan and then I raised some money, quit my other business, which was investing and moved to Chicago and opened up uh, in total, like out to about 15 locations. And I had two down in Scottsdale um, and like the other 13 in Chicago. And I closed the ones in Michigan. Um, but yeah, so like I had a, you know, I also had a cleaning business and I was doing a couple of different models. And like, it was, it was, it was, the systems are in place. Everything was running well. 
Um, and then what happened was, you know, 2020 came along and completely wiped away everything. But I feel like I was really fortunate because as I, as 2020 happened, I had somebody who wanted to buy my business and buy all my contracts and buy everything. And I was like, well, there's no cash flow coming in. I don't know really what's going on. And like, I'm like, why not? You know what I mean? Like, I'll, I'll, I'm going to try something else. And, and so anyways, I um, sold off all of my homes, sold off all my contracts. And during that time period of like building up my business and finding all these homes, one thing I did really, really well was understand the data and understand where the most profit was in all of Chicago, what type of homes, um, what the home needed to look like. Like, and I figured out, I, I had this like system that I would use to sort through the data and make sense of it, right? And so what I did was I actually just created a course where I taught people how to do this, but I had no idea how to sell it. And I was like, well, I don't want it to go to waste. So I just threw it onto YouTube, right? And it's got, it's like, it's got around like 7,000 to 8,000 views so far, right? That's good. And yeah, and through that though, it's literally, it turned into an Airbnb data consulting business. So like so many people have reached out to me and so many people have worked with me that I have now have like a system and a business behind helping people understand the data. Um, because, you know, if you don't understand the Airbnb data, you're going to be shooting yourself in the foot before you even get started. Right. Uh, but anyways, that's the short story of, of how I went from renting out a spare room to being the Airbnb data guy. Cool. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit, just a little bit of background for people who might have never put a property on Airbnb and stuff like that. Like what kinds of data is important? What kind of things are you really need to focus in on in order to make sure that it isn't better just to, you know, rent long term or, you know, take some other option? Yeah. So that's a, that's a, a really good question that has a ton of answers, right? Um, and the, the reason being is because, you know, there's a lot of different factors that come into play that will determine like if the place is profitable or not. And generally like you, you can't um, just assume this sort of like blanket, uh, blanket assumptions don't work because it's different in every single city and every single different location. So like some really easy examples from my own experience that I talk about quite a bit is that um, a four bedroom in this certain spot of Chicago, right? So Lincoln Park, Chicago, this one neighborhood, um, a four bedroom was very profitable, right? And, and most of the reason is because there aren't any five bedrooms. And so it's like the largest home you can get in Chicago and it, it did really well. Three bedrooms would not cash flow at all in the exact same location did not cash flow at all. And like the rent was very close, right? So you'd pay like $3,000 for a three bedroom, but $3,500 for a four bedroom, but the four bedroom could make up to a hundred thousand and the three bedroom could only make about 60,000. Right. <laughs> and so there's, you know, when you ask that question of like, what should you be looking for in general to, to be a good property? It's, it's a kind of a loaded question. Yeah. Um, I will try and give some general, general ideas here. So the first one is that the larger the property, the better, right? Because um, that's where you're not really competing with, with um, like hotels, hotels, and stuff like hotels that, yeah. at all, right? You're not yeah. competing with hotels at all. Um, and you, they can split the bill. So you can do these larger amounts and, and generally like you, even, you know, a lot of the data companies say it as well. The larger the property, the better off that you're going to be able to do. Um, if you're in vacation areas, right, like vacation towns, uh, you, you want to kind of find a spot where the real estate hasn't gone through the roof if you're going to be purchasing. Um, but there's still a good amount of demand coming to the area that's going to allow for you to actually cash flow off of that property, right? That's where you find a ton of opportunity. It's where you get into like the cities where it becomes really complicated because honestly, like you, there's, I remember there was one side of the street would make like $20,000 less than the other side of the street. And it was like, and it's just, what? it's what I call, yeah, land borders. There, there, there's, you know, there's probably a street that you know of. I know there's one in my hometown where on one side of the street, you wanted to grow up on the other side of the street, you didn't <laughs> want to grow up on. You know what I mean? And then, like, that's all it was, right? And, um, but anyway, so yeah, like the, the, the cities get a lot more complicated and that's why, you know, I have business uh, helping people with the data. But it, as a general rule, like the bigger the property, the better. And always just try to pay the minimal amount that you possibly can while ensuring that there is still good demand. Um, and then if, you know, views are going to increase the amount of money that you're going to make, the better the views, the more money you're going to make. The closer you are to water, the more money you're going to make. Um, we're talking about vacations here, right? Like people right. pay for these things. And so that's kind of the stuff you want to focus on. Yeah, yeah. makes sense. Does it mm -hmm. also depend on your particular 
ability to be involved. So obviously if I have to pay a property manager and a cleaner and all that kind of stuff versus oh, yeah. if it's next door and I'm going to be able to do that stuff myself. Yes. Big time. Right. So one issue that I see a lot of people making is that they just buy a prop, like they, they want to get into Airbnb for the passive cash flow. And so what they do is they just, you know, do some research, buy a property, get somebody else to manage it, somebody else to clean it, and they never touch it. And those people almost never cash flow, right? They own the property. Sometimes like their bills are being paid, but um, they're not really making anything else. And sometimes they have to like pay the extra, but they're the, they're the ones in my mind that actually lose out the most when they try and get into this. Yeah. Uh, now that's not to say that there's not good and great property managers out there, or if you just set everything up like really, really well, and then hand it off to somebody to just like take care of the guests, you can definitely do that as well. And like, it, it would be profitable. Um, it's just really, really risky to buy a property, assuming that it's just going to make crazy amounts more and have the property manager because, you know, property managers, they, they're, there's tons of them <laughs> and like <laughs> there's so many of them and so many of them are really bad at airbnb <laughs> like they like they're so bad at the marketing side so bad at like the the pricing the the ranking they just they just all they know to do is like take care of the home as in, in the sense of like if a doorknob breaks like they're really right. great at that right. and, and some aren't even great at that but like yeah so i don't know my i always tell people like that's that's uh uh, a really scary dream of just like doing it. But if you do the legwork at the beginning, you understand it yourself, you really get good at it. You can just sort of bring someone on to take care of it, which is what I ended up doing, right? You know, I got my properties up and running and I paid somebody to run them all. But did, you, did they run them, including the Airbnb side of it? Meaning, yes. you know, they're responding to the guests and stuff. Yes. Now my, yes, but it took a ton of training, right? Yeah. Cause that's where I've never been comfortable letting go, you know, like, yes, you can clean it. You can fix everything. You can, you know, something happens, but right. I feel like I've always had to be the one communicating with the guests because it, even I sold my property and because there are still people there under my name, I'm still communicating with them. Cause I feel like that's where you get your super hosts. That's where you get your, you know? Yes. So, um, like that's, so to me, I had to get rid of, I had to let go. It took me a while. Like I had to let go because I, I wanted to keep expanding and I had so many, I, it was a certain, it was a scale thing. You know what I mean? It was like, I have to get somebody else to take this over at some point. Yeah. Um, where if you have just one property and you want to be on top of it, stay in communication with guests is like number one, right? That's, that's probably the last thing you get rid of. Yeah. 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 And I'm, I'm all about now. It's so great now that Airbnb allows you to schedule the messages. You know, I used to yeah. be like, oh, now I got to send them a thing like, oh, you're going to check in tomorrow. Here's all your info. But now it's like, yeah. oh, this goes out two days before. And this goes out, you know, seven yeah. o'clock the day they check in and all that stuff. So it's, that really cuts down a lot. There were, uh, there's been softwares that have, have actually done that for like since 2017, since I got, I think they've even been around since like way earlier than that, but they did the so it took Airbnb forever to implement that into their platform, but like there were, you could pay like 10, $20 a month and they would automate your messages and do a ton of other things too. But that was, that was a, I remember when I first implemented that, like how much easier it was to get communicate with the guests. Cause you're sending the same thing over and over, right. It kind of gets tedious. Yeah. 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 Well, so I'm curious because I know there's certain markets where people think, oh, you know, like if I go buy a, a big house in Nashville, I'm just going to make a ton of money. Right. And how do they, how do, well, first of all, let's talk about how people first find you and like how you open the, open up the world for them. So they all of a sudden have. Yeah. So YouTube is where I have everything. I find YouTube is like, without a doubt, the best place for my type of content, because um, it's confusing. Data is confusing. And I try to make it as simple as possible. Right. And so I have two different courses on YouTube that explain data. One's like very entry level, um, helping you like break down a market, very manual. The other one's more advanced and you have to actually work with me for it to, to, to be useful for you. Um, and then I just have like other videos out there that just talk about data in general. And so, like that's where if you're if you know if you're trying to understand data you type in airbnb data or air dna into youtube there's going to be my videos no you yeah. just went quiet for a second sorry i was i thought it was but oh. you, then you came back so that's good oh okay perfect <laughs> good, sorry good. about that <laughs> yeah no worries yeah so you know if you if you want to find me that's like where i 
at YouTube is where I have all of my stuff that will help you help break it down. Um, and so that's my strongest recommendation to start there. Yeah. And, and when some, when people come to you now, are they saying like, I want to invest in the United States anywhere, or are they saying this is where I am? And can you help me figure out where the best, what the best property is? A uh, combination of those things, right? So usually, like I would say the majority of the time, what happens is that somebody has a, an idea of where they want to go, right? So they're like, hey, I want to, I want to make Dallas work or uh, like, I want to open up some properties in Dallas or I want to open up some properties in Tampa, like whatever it may be. Yeah. And they're coming to me saying like, can you help me? Can you, uh, I, like, cause I build reports for people, right? So they're like, can you build a report for Dallas um, so that I can understand Dallas and, and all the information on it? And like, obviously, yes, that's what I do. Right. So I help them understand that. Yeah. And then honestly, the, the, the almost, it's almost always the last question, especially for people who already know where they want to go. They're like, where is the best place to go in the entire country? Right. Like it's, uh, I always get it. Every single, every single person asks the same question, <laughs> but uh, not, like, not at first the way they should. Not right? at first. No. Yeah. Cause, <laughs> because, and it's, it's smart not to ask it at first. Right. Because most people, especially when you're first starting to get in into this, like you really like, I strongly recommend if you can do it where you live, it's hundred percent going to be the easiest way to do it. But if you can't, like I live in a place where I can't, there's there, you, you just can't do it here. Um, you know, go somewhere where it's like two to five hours away max. Right. Yeah. And like do it within that range. But then if you really can't do it there, then go somewhere else. Um, so they're usually starting off with like where they, where they're close to. And they're asking about that. And then they're like, what if I were to do it somewhere else? Right. And, uh, and so I kind of have like a staple question answer for that one that I always I, like blanket advice that I give to everybody, which is that, you know, first off you, um, hotels are absolutely everywhere, right? So if hotels are everywhere, then there's money to be made almost every, everywhere with when it comes to short-term rentals, because right. people need the hospitality, right? Um, but then, so like, you got to keep that in mind. And if you can't do it where you're located, go where you want to go. Like there's nothing better than owning an Airbnb where you actually want to travel. I had, I had a couple of places down in Scottsdale and like, it was amazing. Like I love, I got to go there every once in a while. And I just absolutely loved everything about that. Sedona was like two hours away. I uh, got to go there a couple of times. Right. And it just, it makes you want to be there more. Right. It makes you want to take better care of the property. You never want to go somewhere where it's just like, just the, the, the profit is maybe the profit's a little bit better, but you never want to be there. Right. It just kind of contradicts your drive to go there. Um, but the third one obviously is like, you know, if you, if you really, really don't care about the place or the location, then just, you know, there's the try and go, um, to the outskirts of really popular places. Cause that's where you're going to find that the real estate's good and there's still good demand. So that's, that's a really long answer to, to that question, but yeah. <laughs> no, it's good. But you know, I, it's funny. Cause you just reminded me totally, not totally off topic, but it's interesting. Um, I was talking to a friend of mine who lives near Orlando. And she's like, I couldn't do Airbnb around here because everybody does it. But I thought I would think that in an area like that, that there would be a demand for like executive rentals, you know, like a place where that's not for kids. You're going to be there for work and you want to be, you know, that it's just like a totally different feeling, like my, more of a, like a high, higher yeah. level. Does something like that make sense? Like a different yep, mindset around the same, do you same know what concept. I'm trying to say? I know exactly what you're saying. Yeah. So that is the, that's the, not necessarily the newer version that like the gurus are pushing, but um, I mean like that model, the executive stay, it's called like corporate rentals is generally the, the, yeah. the, the term for it, right? Like the 30 day stays um, type of people. Uh, so that is something that is being pushed more often now by the, 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 you know, viral YouTube people who teach about Airbnb is about getting into an apartment building, getting 10 units in that apartment building and renting them out somewhere between like a week to three months or sorry, a week to 30 days um, and, and making them more corporate, more high end, more for those types of people. Right. And so like, that's the, that model definitely works in a ton of places, uh, obviously metropolitan areas. Right. Um, I haven't done it myself. I've, I've looked into it. I've actually tried doing it in Chicago when I was there, but they just like, I couldn't get into any of the buildings. Um, and so, so it definitely works, but you, you know, you, you just have to go that model, right? It's like any business. You kind of have to choose who is your customer archetype and then where are they? And then um, supply exactly what you want to supply to them. Right. Um, so, yeah, so that's, I, that, that should answer that. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> 
It's interesting because I just kind of did that like instinctively because I thought, well, you know, when I go to Orlando, I would love to be in a place where there is no flipping kids, you know, <laughs> 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 nobody's peeing in the pool here, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. But the, the whole thing about Orlando is, is Disney, right? So like the vast majority of the people, like probably 80 to 95% of the people going are going to be families and kids. And so it's the easy one to target, but it's, it's, it can be oversaturated. Right. So like you can kind of carve off your own little niche by doing that. Um, so yeah, that's not, it's not a bad idea. It's just hard to determine without doing a lot of research, how good it would actually be. Right. right? Exactly. Which is where the data comes into play. Right. Yeah. Um, because if I were to be going into Orlando, what, and, and I had that idea, what I would be doing is, you know, using my reports to go through all of the one bedrooms, uh, specifically within a certain section and trying to figure out what was allowing them to make a lot of money, right? Um, and I would try to figure out if there was a difference between the family oriented places and the sort of like executive oriented places, right? Um, and, and seeing if there was even a, like, even if they existed, right? If they didn't exist, then there's opportunity to create something that doesn't exist. Um, but um, if they do exist, you're going to very clearly be able to see what the revenue difference is between those two, right? Um, and, and that sort of style and like how you're promoting, because I've done a ton of research in Kissimmee, which is right outside of Orlando. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I know what drives the revenue there. And like, without a doubt, it's you've got like Disney creates an immersive experience. You have to create an immersive experience in your home. If you do that, it allows for this like holistic experience for the family and the kids and, and people are going to pay way more for that than just a house, right? Yeah. Um, but I don't know what the executives stays would look like. So anyways, that's my two cents on like how to figure that answer out. Yeah. Well, it's interesting, John, it seems like your data analysis, is there a lot of sort of, in, at least in the beginning, is a lot of kind of manual, you know, looking at stuff and trying to figure out how the data work. Cause it, I mean, how can you kind of, how do you do it? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, great question. <laughs> the the, the thing about data, right? And everyone, I feel like when everyone hears data, they're just like, that's confusing. It makes no sense. I don't understand what you mean, right? Like, <laughs> and like that's, that'll be I, numbers. I don't speak that language. <laughs> I don't, right. And, 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 and like, that's not the reality of data. Honestly, it's not. And so um, I don't have a data background, right? I did not go to school for this. I did not, I did not do any research on it. I like tried to actually study what the like true data people study. And I got lost. I was like, this makes no sense. <laughs> and so I, and so I stopped it, right? Like I was taking an online class. Um, so when I talk about data, all I'm really talking about is finding a pattern or a trend, right? So that's, that is all that data is. It is trying to find some sort of consistent pattern that is repeatable. And then you, you repeat it. And if you repeat it, you're likely to get the same results. And so you have a liar, higher likelihood of confidence in what you're about to do, right? So if I see that, you know, a bunch of four bedrooms in a certain area of Chicago are all making a hundred thousand, hundred thousand dollars a year. If I open a four bedroom in Chicago and do exactly what they're doing and maybe a little bit better then I could probably make a hundred thousand, right? Um, Cause there's clearly a uh, demand for it and that's how much they're, they're likely making. And so like, that's, that's all it is, right? Um, and so a lot of the data providers that are out there right now, um, they, the way that they display their data doesn't allow you to easily see a pattern or a trend, right? They, there's no easy way to see that consistency. Yeah. And so the process that I teach is essentially taking all of that information and organizing it in a way that allows you to clearly see a pattern, right? And there is without a doubt, a manual process to this. Like yeah. you have to go through the listings and take a look at, because take a look at the listings to understand them because um, there can be such a difference in the way that they're displayed and what's actually driving the revenue. Yeah. But what you end up find, figuring out is that, you know, all of the homes making a hundred thousand in a certain area, they're all fairly large homes. They have, they have uh, space for a dining room. They're themed in a certain way. Their kitchens are fairly new. Um, they have a backyard, right? And so you find all these little things and then it creates this sort of checklist for you um of if i get all these things i'm going to make a hundred thousand dollars off this airbnb right and i know my expenses are going to be sixty thousand so boom i'm in in the green right like right, i'm good right, right? Well, and you also can say and this seems to be you know the ones that are more popular like this is how you can even be better right yes. and make and put yours above what else people are have for options in that area exactly right so like that's 
that is without a doubt the biggest advantage that you would get from my work and like my process is not only are you going to know okay this is generally how much people are making but it's also how do i make more than all of these people yeah. right and you and that's simply by looking at the top performers right there's like uh kiss me like i said i've done a ton of research in kiss me there are four bedrooms that are making more money than uh eight and nine bedrooms in kiss me right four bedrooms and it's simply 100 percent because of the way they design the home and photograph the home and and it's like the and the way they display it and the way that they price their home and they just they understand airbnb they understand their client they understand what's driving the revenue they put the home together specifically for those people and they can ask more on a nightly basis because of that and they get a higher occupancy because their home's 10 times more desirable right, right? airbnb is all about that experience and so with going through the data you start to learn that right and and the cool thing is like the people who are doing the best um they tend to all look the same especially in certain markets right uh like if you're in gatlinburg in tennessee the the, the certain cabin will like really do really really well and then in Florida, a certain like beach home will do really, really well, like theme, style, design, and all that stuff, right? Yeah. But the reality, the cool reality of this is that if you were to switch those homes and put the <laughs> put the the cottage on the beach, right, and the beach home in the mountains, it you would never want it, right? Yeah. It would be it would be the worst thing. So uh, <laughs> that's why I say you can find the consistency because people want a certain thing in a certain location, and so the people who design it the best in that certain area are all kind of doing it in a similar way, and all you have to do is do that similar thing right yeah, yeah. um yeah and this is so i know this is a long answer but a fun little story on this is that there is this company sonder when i first got to chicago that was absolutely killing it and i uh the investors that i was working with refused to pay for an interior designer and like i'm i'm a 24 24 year old male I'm like i don't know how to design anything right like, <laughs> i'm like i don't know Oh, I've never looked into this stuff a day in my life. And so what I did was I looked up their listings and I wrote out every single thing they had in the bedroom and the way that it looked and the way that it was painted. And I went to the store and bought every single last thing, <laughs> did, did the exact same thing they did. Yeah. Like recreated it. And it, why and it not? Worked. Yeah, it worked. <laughs> Theirs were still better, but I got like 90% of the way there. So yeah, oh, that's yeah. great. But it's yeah. funny, I was, uh, you know, thinking about what you were saying about different markets and what's so important and thinking about a place that I had created it was like a tiny house and yeah. no running water, you know, a little composting toilet type of thing. Very, very simple and primitive, but it was rented nonstop because I allowed yeah. dogs and I allowed one night stays. Nice. I mean, I figured weekends, maybe, you know, nope, that place was never empty. And it was like, it made more money. That little yeah. tiny cottage was like, I don't know, maybe 300 square feet, maybe made yep. more money than the, than the two bedroom house that was on the same land. It, it, well, it's it, uh, the very first thing that comes to my head. Like I would love to be able to see those listings, but like my assumption is that you created an experience with the tiny home that was probably romantic for couples to go to that created this like different place than a regular home would. And people are willing to pay more for the experience than just a place to put to sleep, right? Yeah. Um, and yeah, so like, and like, that's what I'm, I, like I said, I think I mentioned this earlier, but like, I'm getting back into uh, owning Airbnbs. Like I'm, I want to purchase Airbnbs and that's a hundred percent what I'm focused on is like, I don't want to, I don't want a place that is just going to be a place to sleep. I want a place that's going to create like a, a, a location where you can create a memory that lasts forever, right? Right. Um, Cause I know, selfishly i know that that's what drives revenue right like not only is it a super cool place to have but i'm gonna make a ton of money right so like why would i not want to go there exactly exactly yeah yeah fantastic yeah. so john what advice would you give to somebody who's doing exactly what you're doing i mean not, you sort of kind of already did this but let's just say like okay you know i just want to get a place you know with, like we say within two hours of my house that's going to be profitable so what should i look for so um Okay. So let's think exactly like the, obviously the closer you are, the better it's going to be. I already mentioned that, right? Sorry. The easier it's going to be. It doesn't yes. mean it's going to be the most profitable place in the entire world, but like to get started, to get up and running, uh, it's without a doubt going to be easier. Now, if you have zero Airbnb experience, my recommendation is maybe not to buy a place to get started, but to rent out somebody else's home and run it as an Airbnb um, to get the experience. Now go as small as you can with this, because you don't want to be spending a ton of money just to get the experience. Right. 
Or if you know somebody who's uh, has an Airbnb, maybe ask to like help run it or to like do work with them for free just to get the experience. Because I think it can be one of the Airbnb can one of the be one of these things where if you have zero experience with it, it's really confusing. Um, but as soon as you have experience with it, it's really simple, yeah. right? Yeah. And it becomes really easy. And so what I, I guess what I'm saying is like, try to get that experience. Yeah. On somebody um, else's dime. On somebody else's dime. Yep. <laughs> and exactly. And, uh, and once you get that experience, then start doing that, doing the research. Right. Um, and I, so regulation is first, understand your regulation for wherever you're going to go. And data is second, right. And data is simply just under whatever market you're going into start to understand the, the the data that is there and try to find the patterns and the trends to figure out what is driving the most revenue, making the most amount of money, and then uh, create a sort of buy box where you have all this different criteria of what drives the revenue, and then go out and find the home that would cash flow for you um, based off of that revenue. So in other words, if the home, if you find out that a bunch of four bedrooms are making $100,000 a year, and you know that the, all of the expenses um, to run that four bedroom is going to work out to be to sixty, seventy thousand dollars a year. Then you are going to make about thirty thousand dollars off of that property, right? And if you yep. purchase it, then you have your built-in equity and appreciation, um, and all of those things as well, right? But um, like, just take the time to get the experience, do the work, do do the research work, and and go from there. And if you need help, you can always reach out to me, and I can work with you on that too. Perfect. And and my YouTube has tons of content. Like I have a lot. I have two free courses, right? So like, there's a lot of information on there about my process, about exactly how I do everything. So John, what is your, is it John Bianchi? Is that what your YouTube channel or do you have a yeah, fancy just, name? Yep. First and last name, John Bianchi, John Bianchi, John Bianchi. Um, oh, sorry. You, no, no, no. That's okay. I'm going to pronounce it my way. Okay. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> totally fine. Bianchi is the Italian way. Bianchi is the Canadian way. And so oh, I, right. I sorry. Care either way. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so that my name is, is if you type it into YouTube, you, you'll be able to find me. If you also type in Airbnb data or air DNA, um, you're going to be able to find me as well. And, uh, if anyone actually just wants to reach out to me directly, you can, you can reach out to the email and I respond to every single email. It's hello at point So yeah. Cool. So yeah. John, we've covered a lot of ground and I know we could talk longer because we both have had some similar experiences and we could have some fun, you know, chats, but, oh, yeah. um, what's one question that you wish I would have asked you that we just haven't touched on today? Um, I think the idea of, of using Airbnb to, in a lifestyle sort of manner, right? So like, how can Airbnb be a lifestyle manner for, you know, people who are retired essentially, right? Um, you know, Airbnb, when you're first getting up and running, it's a little bit tricky. You gotta, you gotta learn a lot to understand. There's a lot of systems you gotta figure out, but once you get that property up and running, the furniture's in there um, and you've figured out how to take care of these guests really well, it is so simple and so easy to run an Airbnb. Like it really is, especially one or two, right? And so, you know, if you are retired and you're trying to look for a way that is, you know, not going to take up a ton of extra time, not going to like hold you back on things you want to do on the weekend, um, like not going to hold you back on if you want to travel and, and still provide that extra cash flow. Airbnb is without a doubt, one of like the best things that exists in the, the modern world to allow you to do that. Um, and so I rec like, I strongly recommend it to anybody who's looking to do that. Uh, on top of that, with that being said, I always need to mention that that the vast majority of air of homes that exist would not make more money as an Airbnb, right? The vast majority, there's very few, you have to have the right location, the right bedroom size, the right, like size of backyard. You have to have the right, all the right features for it to actually be cash flow positive for you. Right. So Compared to a long-term rental, you mean? Compared to a long-term rental, exactly, yeah. right? And so, you when I when I give that advice, I'm not just saying go get any home and turn it into an Airbnb, and you're going to put in a bunch of work, and it's going to make you money. Right. What I'm saying is, be strategic about it. And if you're strategic about it, you can find a few properties that will actually cash flow for you, and it'll supplement your income really well for minor amount of work, right? And so. Um, yeah, just just do your research on it and and like you can really figure those things out fairly easily. Beautiful. Excellent. Yeah. John, thanks so much for being with us. I, I love talking to you. You know, I never really 
because I'm doing these things instinctively when I'm helping somebody set up an Airbnb or like, you know, cause my boyfriend just did his and I'm, you know, looking around what else is out there. What's good about them. What's bad about them. How do we want to advertise this one? Because what's, what makes it special right. and not realizing that, you know, it, it's an industry, it's a thing, you know, it's something that you could definitely do to help people. It's that's, it's awesome yeah. that you kind of figured it all out, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it, it worked out in a way I kind of just that exact process that you just mentioned, I just sort of turned it into like a course, right. Um, yeah. And put systems to it and, and like made it easy for new people who didn't know anything about this to leap like way ahead of me. Right. Yeah. Uh, and the, the years that it took to figure that out. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, and that's it, right? You turn, they say, turn your mess into a message or turn, you know, take the, something you wish yes. or you're teaching yourself of five years ago, right? Or yes, however yeah. many, right? Well, exactly. exactly five years in your case, right? If yeah. I known this five years ago, boy, could I have saved some time and money? <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's exactly awesome. it. Smart, smart. Excellent. Mm -hmm. So great meeting you. Great meeting you too. Thanks for having me on. Yeah. And thank you, listener, for listening. I know that, you know, you're thinking all of a sudden now your wheels are turning and you're like, hey, man, I could rent an apartment next door and I could put it on Airbnb, but I really need John's help. So make sure you check him out. His YouTube is John Bianchi, Bianchi, John Bianchi. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we'll pronounce it your way. Um, <laughs> John Bianchi, spelled Bianchi, no. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, and uh and also share this episode with somebody who, you know, has been thinking about, you know, starting up an Airbnb or, you know, maybe a little bit intimidated, maybe a little bit not sure what to do. I think John could really be a great benefit and certainly just listening to this podcast will definitely help them out and be sure to be here next week when we'll have somebody else cool for you to learn from. Have a good week.